I was actually diagnosed with MS more than 10 years ago. So I'm actually not doing that well anymore. <laughs> I'm doing fine, thank you, but not as good as I could I could wish. I'm I'm most of the time I'm in a wheelchair. I can't fish wading anymore. I can't walk in a stream. I can't really walk that far. You know, when I when I talk to people, I say, if you have any plans, if you want to go, like if you want to fish for steelhead in British Columbia, if you want to go for, you know, to New Zealand to fish for brown trout, if you want to go bone fishing in the Caribbean, go now. Do not wait. Do not wait for retirement. That was Martin Jorgensen giving us all some great advice for fishing and for life. The Global Fly Fisher today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. I have a few slots available for the next Alaska trip uh, this summer, so uh, go to wetflyswing.com slash destination to find out how you can uh, connect with ex- expert guests uh, from the podcast and yours truly on an upcoming fishing vacation. Uh, in today's episode, I talk with Martin Jorgensen, the man behind the 23-year-old globalflyfisher.com. We talk about his local waters and brown trout, uh, aka sea trout, how to tie durable flies, and how to land fish the right way. And uh, find out uh, what not to post on your website and social media accounts, the editor's picks on his site, and how to tie the night dancer. Don't miss this one as Martin tells us about the more than 2,500 blog posts and 10,000 fly fishing videos he has on the site. This episode is sponsored by Deli Fresh Design, an all-American creator of fine, sustainable fly fishing gear. Stay tuned later in the show to hear how Ross does his part to uh, reduce his waste and impacts with DLD and how he builds uh, great equipment in a sustainable fashion. You can find fresh equipment designs on Instagram at Deli Fresh Design, and you can get 20% off your next order using the coupon code WFS20 at DeliFreshDesign.com. We are also sponsored by The Great Drake, who provides high-quality heritage fly fishing tackle while being a good steward of our uh, sport. The new Fall Run fly box they have available for 2019 features small and medium-sized clips on one side of the box and um, slotted cork on the other. Naturally self-healing and hydrophobic will hold flies from the smallest midge to the largest stoneflies. Head over to thegraydrake.com and use the coupon code WFS20, that's WFS20, at checkout to get 20% off your next order of Vintage Today. So... Without further ado, here's Martin Jorgensen. How's it going, Martin? Thank you. Very, very fine. Thank you. It's uh, getting warm here. Summer's coming. Is it? So, um, yeah, absolutely. We're uh, we're really seeing uh, summer now, so it's uh, very nice here. Oh no, kidding! Well, what's the um, so? What's a hot day, or what's a hot day over there? Well, if we get into the hundreds, it's really hot here. That yeah. would be like 30, 32 degrees centigrade or something, maybe even more, and that would be really hot. Gotcha. So, and you, I mean, it's quite quite comfortable here. So you would probably, most Americans find it quite quite nice very, here. Very nice. We have a temperate climate because we're so close to the ocean all over the place. So it's it's actually, you know, winters are mild and summers are actually not that hot. Yeah, yeah. And you're in uh, Denmark, right? I am, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Northern part of Europe, yeah. Northern part of Europe, yeah. Well, we're going to jump into definitely be talking about Europe and Denmark and some of the fisheries you have out there. So, yeah, I mean, we have a bunch of, you know, all these shows are the same. Well, not all of them, but a lot of them when I get into somebody like yourself, you know, the global fly fisher has been around for a long time. We'll we'll talk about how long and and everything Mm -hmm. you have going. But maybe just talk about how you first got into fly fishing and then how you brought that all up into the global fly fisher. Yeah, well, uh, actually, uh, you know, like most kids, my father fished. And uh, unlike most kids, it wasn't actually him who brought me into fishing because we went fishing now and then. But uh, I wasn't really into fishing when he was doing it. He would be a fly fisherman. He was also a musician and he would go fishing like, you know, musician played jobs until the early morning. And that often, you know, was perfect fit with going uh, fishing after he was uh, done working. Uh, so I remember him coming back with with uh, his rods and uh, a fish now and then that we could uh, we could eat, mm-hmm. but uh, it didn't really catch on to me. And I was in my twenties, twenty five or something before I started fishing seriously. 
And the reason for that was actually that I went to Greenland. I studied biology on the university in Copenhagen and was on a field trip to Greenland. And we had to catch some Arctic char there. Hmm. And the, the best way to catch them was actually using a fishing rod So uh, uh, for samples. And that was a lot of fun. And I, I, I fished for these char in a, in a river in Greenland. And I came back home and I thought, well, you know, fishing is actually uh, quite quite uh, a lot of fun. I might take it up. And I bought a spinning rod and started fishing. But as all fly fishermen know, you know, spinning is not really, it's not real fishing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it took like a couple of months or something. And I read some books and I, you know, uh, studied other guys on the coast and I said to myself, you know, I got to do that fly fishing thing. That's just so elegant and so nice. It is a gentleman's sport. I need to do that. And I bought a, a, a fly rod uh, actually almost before, before I started fishing seriously. So I, I've never really been a spin fisherman. But um, yeah. Yeah, and you know how it works. You know, you, you if you start out spinning and and then you grab a fly rod and you think you're going to own the world and you know conquer everything and you realize that you can't do a thing. You can't cast worse than a beep and <laughs> everything is terrible and you you basically become a fly rod owner. And when you go fishing, you bring the fly rod and you keep the spinning rod in your car. And when you've been, you know, whipping the water to foam for a while, you go up and pick up your spinning rod and, yep. and start uh, fishing for real. And it took a while before I realized that I probably needed to go with somebody that actually knew how to fly fish and, and could teach me a bit, uh, you know, and show me how to do things. And when, once that started, I, I just kept fly fishing. Yeah. Who was the, uh, who was that person that showed you how to? Uh, actually, I went on a trip with my cousin who was a really avid fly fisherman and he'd been that since he was a kid. I remember him. He's a bit younger than me and I remember him fishing from, from when we were boys and he uh, he said, you want to go? You know, we're going on a trip to the coast, you know, someday. And uh, yeah, I said, great, I'd love to. And I went with, uh, with, with him and a couple of other really experienced guys. And one of the guys was really nice. And he spotted immediately that I, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> and he, uh, he started, you know, handing me flies and telling me, helping me adjusting the leader. And, you know, once... I got a bit of help, and it actually worked out quite nice. And uh, once I started it, uh, you know, doing it on a regular basis, it it came to me quite quickly. So uh, yeah, yeah, and I became a fly fisherman. There you go, yeah. there you go. And so, so you got all that going, and then so and then, how does the the um, globalflyfisher dot com? How does that all come? Yeah. To the me? The website, I, I'd been fishing for a while, and, and we might return to the kind of fishing I do here, mm -hmm. which is coastal fishing mainly on a, for, for a sea-run brown trout. And that's quite popular here in Scandinavia and in the northern part of Europe. And a lot of tourists will come to Denmark to fish. Um, and back then, we were in the early 90s, mid-90s or something, 1994, uh, people would, you know, I was on the web very, very early because I worked with computers and 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 uh, did a lot of work with computers and and I was in what was called news groups and on email lists and stuff like that where people would discuss discuss fly tying and fly fishing, and um, I would get the occasional mail from a German or a Dutch guy or somebody in Sweden or even Danish guys saying, you know, we are going fishing uh, for sea trout on the coast in Denmark. Can you? Uh, can you offer some tips and maybe tell us which flies to use and what gear to use and whatnot? And I would kind of compile a small mail that I would send to people. And this mail just keep, kept on growing, like, hmm. you know, a document. And I would just cut and paste and send people a mail. And uh, it became like, you know, a small pamphlet or whatever uh, that you could uh, – you would tell you essentially where you could go and uh, help you find good spots to fish and what flies to use and you know what yeah. whatever was needed and it was actually i maintained this document and kept, it kept on growing and at this point the world wide web was getting like a foothold and was becoming a thing and the place that i worked the it um, department had set up a web server one of the first web servers i ever hmm. you know encountered and i asked them you know can i have a, a small corner to play in like you know whatever um 
if you can offer a bit of space and I can get some rights to upload stuff and yeah, no problem. You know, this guy, he said, you know, you can just whatever, you know, you just take it. We don't use it seriously. Back then it wasn't even the company didn't have, have a proper website. Nobody really had, you know, like today, everybody yeah. has a website. Right. So I got a, a small corner, you know, and I had a, a, an address for that document. And basically what I did was just convert the whole document to HTML and upload it to the server. And then when people asked me, they could get a link to the <laughs> document instead of the mail. And of course, it kept on growing. <laughs> it grew and grew. And, you know, then I had to kind of, you know, I could see that I had to introduce some kind of structure and have, you know, like a section with patterns and a sh- section with gear and a section with places to go and a section with whatnot. And, and slowly it just kind of evolved and, and suddenly I had a website. Um, and the website was back then was ca- called Fishing Denmark. And that was simply because when I sent the mail to people, the subject would be Fishing Denmark. Right. And um, so that was the name of the website. Hmm. And that just kept on growing and actually became quite popular. Mm-hmm. And within a couple of years or so, I got in contact with quite a few other people who had also made websites. And uh, and a couple of those were, you know, one was Steve Schweitzer, who's a guy from Colorado. And and and, um, and he had a site that he had a hard time maintaining. Another guy was uh, Bob Skihan, who was a fly tire from the U.S. North, uh, Northeast, who did streamers and stuff like that. And both of them needed, you know... Uh, we needed to cooperate because maintaining a site alone was quite a lot of work. So uh, we actually got together and we met actually in the U.S. Uh, and talked about, you know, um, making a, a joint effort. What and, year was that? That This was back in 96, I think, okay. 1996. So it's quite a long time ago. So basically the, the foundation for the site is more than 25 years old. And the site itself as it is now is, is close to 25 years old. Wow. So it's been around for really, really many years. Huh. So, um, yeah. And, and it is now what you see. It's a, a very large site with lots of content and yep. has been around for a long time. And basically, everything that was on there back then is still on there and just keeps on growing. And yeah. you know, I'm the main kind of drive driving force behind it, but still have uh, uh, contributions from a lot of other people who kind of write and take pictures and uh, whatever. So yeah. yeah, and videos and everything. Oh, that Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, a quarter of a century you've been going, going strong in that thing. And I mean, what would you, you know, for somebody that, you know, globalflyfisher.com, anybody can go take a look, but what would you say for somebody who, um, if you had to describe it for somebody who's never been on your site, what, how would you describe it? Well, it is basically like a magazine, uh, and it's it's as you can almost read from the from the the name of the site. It's an international magazine, means that it covers all kinds of fishing. It's not only like uh, you know the Midwest or only brown trout or streamers or or uh, salmon fishing or fly tying. It's uh, basically everything that's uh, connected with fly fishing and fly tying. So it's like. Uh, gear and technique and books and videos and patterns and right. stories told by people it's even even um, uh, books you know uh, uh, book reviews and and you know all kinds of things and and of course being it's non-commercial nobody makes any money from mm-hmm. it doesn't have any ads or anything so that means basically it's a playground you can do i can do anything i want and people can write basically anything they want and in most cases i'll publish it if it's if the quality is good enough which is basically the only kind of uh, uh, thing that i want from from material is i want good quality i want something that's well written or well photographed or mm-hmm. really interesting so uh, mm-hmm. yeah. that's awesome so it's a I call it a playground, and I do it for my own sake. I love it when people go and look at it, and a lot of people go and look at it. But for me, it's kind of a place where I can get, you know, where my own ideas can get free run, and I can do what I what I want to do. I can write about what I want. If I want to go totally nerdy about something and write about, I'm just doing a an article now, a fairly long article about tying durable flies. You know, uh-huh. how to get your flies to last longer. And it's a document, I think it's 40 pages or something now, you know, you keep on going, there's a lot of neat tricks and that, you know, I, I, it's, nobody could do that in a commercial magazine or anything that would be way, way, so way much. too 
thorough and way yeah. too much, but I can do it on my side because uh, I'm the boss and I decide. <laughs> so that's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, we're going to get into a bunch more, but be, you know, before we get into, um, I guess more of you know some of the global and some of the sea trout stuff. Um, so as far as uh, tips, durable tips, I mean that's a great uh, topic. If you just had to pick up, pick up maybe a one or two of the best tips, what, what, what is that to make a durable fly? Well, well, if you if you want to tie a durable fly, first of all, don't use too many wraps. Don't keep mm. on wrapping because keeping on wrapping. If you, a, a very good friend of mine, Wayne Llewellyn, who's a really, really good fly tire, says, you know, three wraps can hold anything. Yep. And that's true, you know. Three wraps is more than enough to hold a full salmon fly wing. Everything else you, you know, pile on there is basically just volume. Mm -hmm. So, and, and in many cases, you know, wrapping on top of wraps that are too loose will just make your fly worse. So, mm -hmm. you know, keep the number of wraps down. And um, yeah. basically le learn, learn you know, proper tying technique because, you know, I see a lot of guys lose, using a lot of glue and a lot of, you know, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, tricks to make right. their flies last. And basically you don't need that. It's amazing how durable a fly can be if you don't, if you do it properly and if you finish the materials right and, and do it the right way. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably yeah. the most important part, you know. I gotcha. And and you yeah. probably have, I mean, you obviously have fly tying uh, information there. And I mean, it seems like it's amazing. Yeah, you have this huge website with all this information on fly fishing from around the world. And I mean, you're doing it just on, you know, there's no monetization, there's no advertising. It's all, you know, it's it's kind of cool to, to see that in, you know, a day and age when a lot of the people, you know, there's folks out there trying to, you know, make some money on, on the website and ads and things like that. You know, how, how have you been able to do that? Has this just been something where, well, you yeah. know, I, yeah, I, I wanted to make money from this from, if not day one, then at least, you know, as soon as, you know, money came into the, the yeah. whole, uh, the whole way. Realized. Yeah. Yeah. There's, of course, there's a potential uh, if you have a lot of visitors. When when the site was absolutely peaking, it, you, we had like twenty thousand unique visitors every day, which wow. is like like yeah, a it's a really a lot of people. And and that should you would think that that would make you know a very good foundation for ads and for making money and for whatever. The thing is that fly fishing is kind of, you know, yep. exotic. It's kind of niche. And, and the people who want to get a hold of 20,000 or 10,000 fly fishermen, they are not many. And uh, <laughs> they are not they are not the most wealthy corporations in the world. You know, it's not like you can call up the Coca-Cola company or something and say, you know, you want to buy, you know, ads right. for a whole year on a fishing site. They will be like, ha-ha, you know, that's not going to be the case. Yep. So I realized, you know, through the years that actually trying a, a couple of times to commercialize the whole thing that uh, you know what i could make maybe a couple of hundred dollars in a month from ads and the ads would be the most crazy you would think that that would be fly fishing or at least fishing ads but what i got was actually you can contact these women in russia or you can you know whatever from yep. all kinds of ad servers all around the world and it doesn't really work that no. well. I think I was I was at, at least really annoyed uh, by it, and and in the end, I just decided, no, you know what, I'm not going to do it. Yep. And I can see nowadays the way that you make money on online is basically you know affiliate links where you link to like Amazon or some other shop, and 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 basically clickbait. You know, if you put on all kinds of stuff, you know, people in Denmark, you know, are investing in this fantastic blah blah blah, and then right. you you will see these these so-called articles all over the web, you know, all kinds of, you know, annoying and, and absolutely irrelevant yeah, right, links right. in, in, and, and I get, if not daily, then at least several times a week, I get mails from people who want to, you know, put posts on the website, guest posts, as it's called, which basically lead back to uh, all kinds of commercial sites, which, oh, right. um, affiliate links that link to shops that uh, when you buy a kayak or a fishing rod or a new, new new truck or whatever people will get a kickback they will get money from from whoever Amazon they uh, refer whatever. to yeah so yeah that's the way it, it works and I, I i just don't want to be a part of that and i i i do computer work uh, you know for a living and make my money there and the web server is paid for by my small one person company and it's not that much money so i decided yeah. you know what 
no commercialism, no nothing. I have my freedom. I can do what I want. I can if if I don't get a an article published this week, well, I'll do it next week. And if yeah. I don't get it next week, well, you know, I'll <laughs> go on vacation and when I come, come back. So I have no pressure of any kind. That's cool. That's cool. And so going back and so 1994, you get this thing started and you mentioned a couple people that were out there, the folks that, um, uh, you know, started with you or they helped back two years in to, to jump mm. in. Who else, you know, as far as online, you know, was there anybody else out there? Was that pretty much it? I mean, as far as the fly fishing space? There was a, a lot of love. a lot of people were very, very helpful and, and I you know I've I, I've been lucky enough to be have been contacted by a lot of people who wanted stuff published and and actually people who have the same kind of uh, uh, philosophy as myself saying you know I want to share this and I want to share this in a way that you know makes it available to people for free and. Um, it could be like uh, I, Chris Helm, who was a very famous. Unfortunately, he's passed now, but a, a very famous uh, deer hair fly tire in the in the U.S. I met him early on, and he had some papers that he used to bring to classes and when he did uh, demonstrations and stuff like that, fly tying demos. And he would he said, you know what? If you want to publish this, please go ahead. You know, I want it to get out there. So I have his old articles and actually some more recent articles uh, that I got from uh, from his wife. I have them on the website because he wanted to kind of share them. I have stuff from Paul Jorgensen. I have stuff from a lot of fairly well-known, uh, you know, fly fishermen and fly tires who just said, you know, we like your channel. You can you can share our our material if you want to, which is really nice and one of the reasons that this, the site has grown as it as it did. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, it's been it's cool because I think actually I'm looking back at a uh, article from uh, yeah 2015 September 13th, and it's an article that um, I sent you. And this is kind of cool to see the process because I um, when I first started my website, it was right around there 2015, I think, in the fall of 2015, and and I was all into the uh, you know the blogging and trying to you know that whole thing you know build a you know some uh, audience or whatever through blogging and. And, you know, I wrote some articles. I had one published on Orvis and uh, this one, Landing Fish, the, you know, the right way. I had actually a couple of uh, photos, I think, that are on your site. So, and I remember that experience because, you know, in 2015, I reached out to you because you were one of the big, you know, Glow of Flight. You were everywhere, you know, obviously <laughs> all the stuff because, you, you know, you Google and your stuff pops up. Yeah, so exactly. I was like, yeah. yeah. So I was like, well, I'll connect with Martin. And I did. And you made it really easy. It seems like I just... I sent you this article I wrote and it was like, boom, boom. And all of a sudden, you know, it's up there and now we're 20, what are we at now? 20, almost, almost four years yep. later. Right. And it's still there. Yep. Yeah. It's, yep. it's still there. Yep. Yeah. That's cool. So that's one of the, one of the ideas is that I try to also give, you know, you're, you were probably into blogging and yep. knew a bit about it, know how to write, but there's a lot of very talented people out there who have no idea. They can't write, they can't set up an article, they can't structure themselves, they can hardly take any pictures, but they have some really interesting thing, you know, interesting angles on fishing or fly tying or something, which is, uh, it's a pity that they have no, they can't contact a, a magazine because the magazine no. will not be able to handle their, no. their, you know, manuscript or anything because it's too poor. I get stuff from, I can tell you, I get stuff from Eastern Europe, from people in the Czech Republic, from Slovenia, from places. And right. these guys do their best to write in English. And it's, I, I'm good. sorry to say so, terrible in many places, in many instances. But I can kind of work my way through it. I can edit their uh, material. I can take my time and do it. And I can get some articles online which are really interesting and really uh, useful but which would never work in a commercial environment. They wouldn't have the time or the, you know, patience or anything to to do that. So I and as you say what I do is actually try to take every every bit of material that I get and get the, you know, best possible article from it and get the presentation nice and get it to look nice. Uh, mm -hmm. Which is I I I love the process. I think it's fun to do and I enjoy when when I do it. And people, of course, most people are thrilled when they see their own like uh, articles online and and yep. get some feedback and comments from people and get maybe a, you, you if they could be a local guide in Slovenia who has written a nice article on fishing dry flies in Slovenia, and suddenly they get a bit, bit of business because there's a link to their website or whatever. There's a phone number or something, which yeah. is the, my way of kind of paying back to people who want to contribute. That's so, cool. That's cool. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, yeah that um, and that was you know a bit ago, and I think yeah that your 
you know, the editing process in it, I'm not sure how much editing on, on mine that was done, but it seems like that's one challenge because yeah, you get these things that aren't very good and, and you totally are right on. I mean, I've, I've interviewed a few editors on here and one, you know, uh, the editor of uh, the fly fish journal, we were talking, you know, about how difficult, how there's only about, you know, a handful of people that even write in that magazine every year. Right. Exactly. And, and so you've got all these people, it seems like, how do you do it all? Is it something, I mean, and how much time does it take you to, you get this article typically to, to edit it and get it out there? Is, is it pretty much like if somebody right now is thinking of an idea, they have this great idea for an article and they haven't been published yet. If they sent you something, what does that process look like? Well, it, it depends. You know, uh, as I said, there's a huge difference between what what skilled writers and, and, and people who know how to write and, and, and you know, send a, a manuscript, what they do and and amateurs so to say yeah. and if you if i get something from a, from a person who has never written an article or maybe just uh, hasn't written much well it it might take me you know half a day or something you know working through the text and 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 making sure that everything is spelled right and that the english is just like you know acceptable and getting hold of of decent pictures in some cases people will send pictures but uh, many of them are shot with a cell phone or something oh, and right. and they're not that good i might need to do some photo, photos myself or get some you know, photos, uh, license-free photos online or something. And I spent maybe three, four, five hours or something on, on the article. And typically, I can return to people within a week or something and, and present them with a laid-out article on this uh, the okay. site that they can kind of preview. And and it's a fairly, you know, smooth and, and typically not time-consuming mm. process. I've done it, a, you know, many, many times. I used to make my living doing editing so oh, okay. i i really you know I, as i say i almost enjoy it it's kind of like you know doing a, a puzzle or something for me it's a it's a lot of fun the process is part of the of the end result i think i i enjoy the process as much as as you know the finished uh, the finished article uh, presented so uh, yeah. yeah gotcha yeah that makes sense so yeah you have a background in it and and so yeah and i'm just looking at one of my photos for that i'll put a link in the show notes to that article and um, so they could take a look, but yeah, that a pretty, uh, there's a photo of underwater fish pick. And I remember that fish. Yeah. I, that's the cool thing about fishing. It was a steelhead, uh, a steelhead that, uh, I caught and it's just awesome to see, you know, when you kind of the memories and all that, but, um, Absolutely. well, you know, the global fly fish are obviously there's a ton we could talk about. I wanted to get into be, uh, you know, a little more specific down into, like you said, at the start, um, coastal fishing for sea run brown trout. Uh -huh. And um, and just talk a little about that for somebody maybe who doesn't know about it. Um, can you start us off first just talking about it? Because there is a little bit of confusion out there, I think, when you hear sea trout, uh, you know, sea run yeah. brown trout, brown trout yeah, Europe exactly. versus Argentina. Can you talk yeah, about yeah. when we say sea trout, are we talking about um, sea run brown trout? And just talk about the life history a little bit of, the you know, yeah, I guess yeah. your species. Well, when, when, when we at, when we here in Denmark say sea trout, we don't mean the sea trout that you guys mean, especially when you go down south in the U.S. and you can catch sea trout in the salt. This is a different species. This is your brown trout, like like you would catch a brown trout in a stream. It's the same species. They can breed together. You know the 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 sea trout we have here and the brown trout you have there in your streams. And we have brown trout too. The brown trout, as you might know, comes from Europe originally and was actually, uh, you know, uh, brought to the U.S. and wasn't wasn't uh, yeah. originally uh, in the U.S. But it's the same species. What we have here is that we have a very sheltered coast, you know, which is not like your Atlantic or Pacific coast, really big, big, uh, you know, waves and things going. We have a, it's more like a, what you would see in a lake, even in a small lake and shallow water, lots of seaweed, you know, rocks, sand, uh, lots of food, water that heats up quickly when the sun shines in the spring. And what the, what the trout do is that the brown trout will actually migrate into the sea to eat during the winter and and no sorry during the summer mm -hmm. so when uh, when uh, when spawning is over they will go into the sea and they will eat what's in the sea shrimp and you know scots and uh, whatever small bait fish and and stuff like that and because the the sea here the coasts and the beaches in the sea is quite accessible it's easy to get to the the, to the water we are close to the country is very small we are very close to the water no matter where you are mm -hmm. 
And also the water is quite protected. It's shallow. It's easy to wade. There's no big waves. There's nothing. It's very obvious to fish in the ocean for these fish. And that's become very popular. The, the, the fishing started off actually in the, in the 40s and the 50s in Denmark. And now it's probably the, the predominant kind of fishing for most, most anglers in Denmark. So what you fish for is basically uh, the bright stage of a brown trout so the mm -hmm. brown trout that you know which is kind of a brownish and leatherish in the skin and has red spots and everything will turn into a silver bar like you know from a salmon that goes into the ocean so what we fish for are bright fish silvery nice fresh and and really beautiful fish in the in the salt and we can do that basically all year round hmm. because the winters are quite mild here so it's rare rarely frozen over the ocean it can be cold i can tell you to fish yeah. in the winter but it's it's possible it's not like you know frozen frozen over and you can fish even now a day like today where it's bright summer and the sun is shining and everything if you find a place with a bit of movement in the water maybe some current or something you can find brown uh, sea trout brown trout okay. uh, in in the in the ocean gotcha. so because that's so accessible and the, the coast is, we, we don't have any any uh, private coasts here, so to say. You can access the coast everywhere. The, the law says that you are allowed to go on the coast everywhere, hmm. even in front of private property, yeah. which opens up to, you know, accessing the water basically everywhere. So it's only like Berg sanctuaries or military installations mm -hmm. and stuff like that, that you can't go to everywhere else you're allowed to go to fish. So that makes it, and, and it's free, I mean, basically free. Yeah. You, you need a state license, which is like $30 or something. Huh. But once you have that, you can fish everywhere. So it's nice and easy, accessible. I have, I'm five minutes away from the water here, so I can go back down to the beach anytime I want to. And most Danes are no more than like, you know, 20, 30 miles away from, from the ocean. So that's become very popular. Mm -hmm. And also, of course, there needs to be fish and there is actually quite an abundance it's not like easy to catch a fish as you can imagine it's in the ocean so these fish can can swim everywhere but you know there there you can you can find fish and you can catch fish which makes it it fun too so uh, okay. it's a very popular kind of fishing and it's the most common kind of fishing here okay and what is the fishing can you describe you know take us to the water and talk about how you catch the fish yeah, basically you, what yeah. you do is it, yeah, you, you, you rig your like six weight or, or five weight, even a seven weight, you know, a, a medium heavy rod uh, with a floating line and a, and a rod length of leader. You use a, a fly, which is basically like a, a shrimp fly, a woolly bugger, a, a scud fly or something like that. You put on your waders and you go to the beach. You can actually go quite close to the beach in your car many places. And, and then you just walk into the water, maybe thigh deep or something, and you start casting. And of course, you don't cast randomly, but in most cases, you actually cast to search for the fish because you won't see the fish. Not like they won't rise and take stuff in the surface. They will eat stuff, you know, in the, in the water. You can sometimes see fish moving. You can sometimes see fish breaking the surface. But in most cases, what you do is actually you find the places that you think the fish are in, like, you know, patches of seaweed, drop-offs, like you would in a, in a lake or some, some place like that. And, and you just cast and cover it with your fly, and then you take a step and you cast again, and you take a step and you cast again, and then you walk along a beach and you try to find your fish. And... You know, once in a while, you'll get a take, you'll get a fish, and, and if you're lucky, you may have run into a school of fish. These uh, sea trout will often, like, uh, go in schools, and there might be, you know, 10, 20, even 50 fish going together, and once you find them, you are you can actually catch uh, quite a few if you're lucky. Gotcha. And the fish are, like, from your, you know, 10-inch fish to, you know, huge fish like in the in the 10 uh, 15 pound range really huge like you would think it was a salmon if you saw it like you know quickly but it's still a brown trout basically yeah okay and so are you and you're not going out i mean these fish aren't coming into like back into the rivers where you're targeting them uh, you're, but you can do that uh, but uh, but in the rivers unlike on the ocean coast it's uh, it's uh, limited 
the the season is is uh, is limited, and also you have to buy a license for that particular water. So, so typically in the rivers, if you want to catch a sea trout, a migrating sea trout in the river, you can you have to catch it in the in the early spring or during a summer night, and during the winter when it's uh, when it's uh, spawning season, you're not allowed to fish them. So fishing will typically close down like maybe August, September, October, or something, and then open up in March or April. And then you can fish during the summer. So, so in the streams, of course, you can also fish for these fish. But like salmon, uh, the fish aren't eating in the streams. They're there to spawn. So it's a different kind of fishing. It's more, much more like salmon fishing, which we also have here. We have a, quite, a, quite a few good salmon rivers too. But, but sea trout rivers are also a thing here. Yep. Uh, but, but it's a different kind of fishing, as I said. In the ocean, you fish for hungry fish. So yeah. it's more like fishing for brown trout in a stream or for bass, you know, or something like that. They will they will attack your fly because they want to eat it, not yeah. for any anything else. So it's a it's a more approachable fishing for many people compared to like salmon fishing or gotcha. or something like gotcha. that. Okay, yeah, and probably if they're fishing in the rivers, it's probably similar to you know if you were going to target them in the springtime when they're you know, migrating or whatever into the, the, you know, streams, you could swing flies would probably be just like Atlantic salmon. That would be the typical method. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, we've got tons of information on swinging and stuff like that, but um, yeah, this is interesting. We, you know, as far as in the ocean, I've had a couple guests where we've talked about some of the ocean fisheries. I had, um, Oh, uh, Dave uh, uh, McCoy was on from uh, talking about up there in Washington State fishing for mm-hmm. uh, yeah. fishing for, uh, for cutthroat. Steel. Yeah, well, yeah. steelhead, but yeah, yeah, cutthroat in the in the ocean, yeah. just yeah. like you're talking about. And can you describe? So, what do you do? So, you wade out there across the the, the breakers, or is this just a more calm yeah? Well, we backwater? don't. We, the thing is that, the, as I said, the ocean is very different here when you compare it to like the Atlantic coast or something or the Pacific coast because the water is more like you would. You would see it in a in a in a calm lake or something. Oh, the breakers okay. aren't break, so you don't have like a, a a surf zone or anything like that. You basically walk into fairly calm water, and there might be a you know a, a sandbar or something you have to cross. But it's not like it's not like it it's fairly shallow. You could typically walk out uh, you know easily walk out you know maybe uh, 300, 400 feet, five hundred feet or something, and still be in thigh deep water, and and cover quite a lot of water there so it's very different from from you know surf fishing as you would see it for stripers or something yeah, like okay. that you can't compare it at all you, yeah. it i would compare it more to it's fishing a lake, a lake yeah. where you can wait you know on on a on a sandbar or something um, That's cool. That's or cool. a very very wide uh, uh, and and shallow stream with with a slow current because we do have current here of course we have tide but not a high tide but we have tide moving which will drive a current so you can actually sometimes have so much current it feels like you're fishing in a in a stream or a river that's you know flowing slowly yeah but in most cases the water is just like small ripples like you would see a, a lake uh, and and um, and you are fishing over shallow water maybe 3 4 feet deep or something so it's a very for, for people coming here knowing you know saltwater fishing it's probably more like fishing the or it is definitely more like fishing the flats in the caribbean than it is like fishing the the coast in the us gotcha Gotcha. And where else are people, you know, is just for sea? And and you do you call them sea trout, or is that typically we call them sea trout? Yeah. yeah. So, um, and where else are there other places where people are fit, using this technique, kind of a similar, you know, um, ocean that you guys have around the? Yeah, well, you yeah. you can do it in Sweden and in Norway and Scandinavia, basically in the northern part of Germany. But the thing is, you know, you have sea trout like in the UK and Ireland and Scotland, like we have them here. You have them in Iceland, the same species again, the brown trout that goes mm-hmm. into the sea. But there you have coasts which are more like your probably northeastern coasts, really yeah. exposed to rocky. Uh, you have a, a f- fairly high tide, so meaning that the tide will, will, you know, the water will go out and come back, in, in, and maybe the difference will be like three feet or six feet or something between high and low tide, sure. meaning that the water really changes in in in, in my local waters. I barely have tide, you know, it's it's inches if it is anything, you know, <laughs> cool. don't feel the tide like that. So that means that it's more constant here. And and in um, I know in the UK, for instance, they would fish for sea run 
uh, brown trout in the estuaries mostly and not fish on the open coast. And if you fish them on the open coast, you will probably need a boat or a kayak or something like that because the coast is much more rough and much more unapproachable than it is here. So there's a huge difference. But I know that in Norway and Sweden, as I said, which are our neighboring countries, you have fishing that looks like ours and the fish are basically the same. But I think it's a general understanding then that Denmark has like the best coastal sea trout fishing oh, okay. you can you can find because of the conditions here simply it's calm it's calm okay and, yeah. and yeah. are you and if you had to pick one time a year is there a best time you know to hit it or it sounds like you just fish year around yeah, yeah you can but i would definitely come in the autumn uh, the autumn is like the spring is like you know you have the fish that you have fish that have been spawning and they will be they'll be hungry they will be fairly easy so to say not that anything is easy in fishing but you know what i mean they're hungry but they're also post spawn fish so they they'll be kind of you know ugly they will be slim they'll be not as strong but when you get into like september october they're getting ready to return to the streams and they are in the prime condition and also they are you know they're approaching the streams they're getting closer the big ones are getting closer to the coast and it's uh, kind of challenging and your the water is nicely you know the temperatures are nice it's uh, it's uh, it's not cold to to fish for them but it's not like scorching hot either so it's actually quite comfortable mm. and um and the fish are just beautiful. I mean, they're just as good, as gorgeous as they can as, as they can become. And and you will find you will find you'll catch really nice, bright, shiny fish, and you'll catch some fish that are starting to color up for the for the spawning. And most of them will be really in good condition, very strong and very very oh, nice. Right. And they're picky, which like you know, for some reason you like to fish for for fish like you know you might have to you know put a longer leader on and use mm -hmm. a bit smaller fly than you usually do so they're kind of you know they're a bit picky and and that's kind of a challenge so definitely september october would be my my favorite time to fish for sea trout okay yeah that makes sense and uh yeah this this is pretty cool so you know you so you know the timing to get out there and and take us to the moment where you're you know kind of just making that first few casts are you making long casts short casts what, what's, yeah yeah, yeah. What's that ba look like? basically what you what we use here is as i said we use a like a five weight six weight is what that's my favorite kind uh -huh. of rod what we use is actually uh, often shooting heads meaning that you have kind of a, a a short fly line and then you have a thin you know shooting line which so it's like your weight forward the uh, line on steroids so you have you have a very you know, short, heavy um, head on the fly, and then you have a thin trailing line. So what you do is basically, you know, you, you're still fly fishing, you have a fly on, but but you are casting this kind of lump or whatever you would call it, which is fairly heavy, meaning that you can, with, with less effort, you can actually do the same casts, and you might even be able to cast a bit longer than you would with a wet forward line. You can easily use a wet forward line, and a lot of people do that, but you can also use this shooting head setup, which, when it's a casting game, is a good idea because you will make a lot of casts. You will basically be casting, taking a step, casting again, taking a step, casting again. So there's a lot of casting and not as much catching. And it's not like in your stream where you know where you see a fish rising or you know that there's a, a you know a small eddy or a, a seam where the fish is feeding or something, and you just need to to target that. In this case, you need to cover a lot of water. And need to search for the fish, so you cast and cast and cast. So that would be that would be it. And then you, in some cases, you see movement. You see something following your fly. You can see the fish in the surface after your fly. In some cases, you will feel a tuck or something. In some cases, you will just feel boom. The fish will go for the fly hmm. immediately. Mm -hmm. And um, the fish are typically, as I said, they're strong. Even in the spring, they're pretty strong and they're a, a, a nice size. And um, the fight is not like it's not like a bonefish or anything. It's it's like a brown trout. You know they can run and they will skip and jump a couple of times. Yeah. But in most cases, you can have them. You can easily catch, you no know, catch uh, or and control a large fish on on a on a five weight rod. It's not like you know you're as I said, you won't lose it because you you your gear is too light. You will actually be fine with with a fairly light rod. Okay. And um, 
And casting a light rod is so much more fun. And of course, catching a small fish on a light rod is also so much more fun. So yeah. you don't want to go too heavy. It's not like your nine weight or 10 weight or anything like that. Don't bring your saltwater gear from right. the <laughs> Caribbean, I think. Bring, bring you know, a light stream rod like uh, or a lake rod or something like that, the nine foot, five, six weight, and you'll be fine with the weight forward. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And what size are these fish typically? Like, what would be an average? Yeah, size? as I said, a ten inch is a, a small fish, uh, yeah. and and your your you you will sometimes bump into a, a twenty inch fish, and, yeah. and 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 people will catch much bigger fish, like like you know twenty five, twenty eight inch fish. Uh, yeah. But they're of course much much more rare. Uh, they will these these bigger fish will often go into the deeper ocean to fish on on bait fish and, and like herring and sand eels and stuff yeah. like that. But you will find the big fish. The biggest fish that I've seen caught for many years was was caught from the coast. You know, and that was a almost twenty pounds huge wow. fish, like a salmon, as I said, yeah. more more like a salmon than a than a trout. But it's still a brown trout. Let's take a quick break from a word from our sponsors. The Grey Drake, since 2014, the Grey Drake's mission has been to provide high-quality heritage fly fishing tackle while being good stewards of our sport. They use sustainable cork instead of silicone or foam inserts in their fly boxes. These cork inserts are naturally self-healing and hydrophobic and will will hold flies from the smallest midge to the largest stoneflies and hoppers. Be on the lookout for the new Fall Run fly box available in 2019. This aluminum fly box features small and medium sized clips on one side and uh, on the other slotted cork, which is perfect for bombers and skaters. Conservation is the key with the Grey Drake, and they support uh, great organizations including Utah Stream Access Coalition and Trout Unlimited's Wild Steelheaders United. Head over to thegraydrake.com to check out their classic selection of fly boxes and wallets today. We are also sponsored by Deli Fresh Design, a company that makes sustainable fly fishing gear in the heart of Denver, Colorado. Deli Fresh blends old waders and cordura canvas to make rugged river tested gear such as fly wallets, koozies, and their classic sling packs. You can listen to the full podcast interview with Ross, the founder of DLD, uh, at episode 79 of, of this podcast. But take a quick listen to a short clip from that uh, interview that gives an example of how Ross reduces his waste with his personal actions as a business and highlights his dedication to conservation. But as a company, I'm trying to reduce my impact uh, by riding a bike or taking uh, the bus or shared uh, shared cars, stuff like that on uh, for commuting. And then, you know, yeah, when I go fishing, I, I'll get in a car, but I, I try to go with other people. And, and so I think there's things that as consumers that we can do on a daily basis, not just not just to uh, to you know throw money at a problem. I think that's the last thing we should be doing is sort of deciding where we can uh, make an impact on a personal level. And I think my own mentality of doing those things on a daily basis, like driving or, or riding a bike, uh, and then trying to see what uh, what materials I can use that reduce waste, or what I'm trying to do as a person and as a company. Let's help Ross. And DLD do great things today and this year for fly fishing and conservation. All of DFD's gear will help you spend more time casting and less time juggling your stuff. To see these great products, go to uh, Instagram and follow them where you can see their latest designs. Or you can head over to DeliFreshDesign.com and use the coupon code WFS20 to get 20% off your next order. Okay, back to the show. So that's a, I mean, and I, I guess you think of the other the sea run brown trout kind of down the Argentina, you know, another part of the world where you, yeah, do, you, you, you see do. the sizes of those fish. It's just fantastic. <laughs> you know, they are huge fish. Yeah. And I guess that's just a, a food thing. They have more. Well, that's the interesting thing because, you know, I just think about all these species down there. I'm not even sure what the, the exact life history there as far as when they're feeding. But, you know, these fish here that you're catching must only be going out into the, 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 you know, the estuary or, I mean, cause they're not staying out in the ocean a long time. Otherwise they would be really huge, like a, like a steelhead or Atlantic salmon. Well, they, right? well they, basically they stay out 
most of the summer. When they go out, they stay out most of the summer. So they will after out after spawning, stay out for a, a, a few months, and return in October, November, December, and stay in the stream. You know, while it's cold, and spawn typically in in the in the dead of the winter, and then return to the stream as soon as no the ocean. Sorry, as soon as they have spawned. So it and and you see the same thing in 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 this, uh, South America. It's the same same pattern that you have and and the the reason that the fish grow so big uh, in in south america is of course there's a, an abundance of really nutritious food mainly uh, small smaller uh, uh, sardines and stuff like that in the ocean which the fish can feed on which means that they will grow really fast and become really big we see some of those fish here but most of the fish that we see here will stay close to the shore and catch like smaller prey like like as i said shrimps and scots and stuff like that yeah but you but you do have atlantic salmon who uh do we do do they get pretty pretty large are they this they do they get huge like 40 pounds or something yeah Yeah. that's right really really huge you get the big fish so so they must be just traveling much further distances to get yeah they go out into the atlantic and up towards greenland and places like that and feed on you know really in the big ocean you can't catch you can catch a salmon from the coast now and then it happens but it's not like them something you target you'd need to go out in a boat like a trolling boat or something and go into the open ocean to get a, a salmon okay okay cool and so you know you know, back to the sea trout. So what's the, you know, when you're fishing in the ocean where you guys fish in these calm oceans, you know, the biggest difference between maybe if you're in the stream and do you, do you go for them in the stream too? Sorry. Uh, so do you go, do you know, when you're, what is the biggest difference between fishing, between fishing in the stream versus fishing out into, in the ocean for these sea trout or is it kind yeah, of well, similar the, gear? Basically what you, what, when you fish for the sea trout, if you fish for the migrating sea trout, in the streams, you fish for them like you would for a salmon. Yeah. Basically, the same gear, spay rods and and fairly you know colorful flies and you you, you know down and across like you would for salmon. You you cast out your fly, you mend it, and you let it swing over, and then you wait for the fish to to take. So it's basically like fishing for salmon. Okay. Of course, you can also fish for brown trout in the streams but when you fish for brown trout it's like you're trout fishing it's just like nymphs and, yep. and dry flies and gotcha. that's a different kind of fishing totally different kind of fishing so so the sea runs and the and the this you know the, the the fish that stay in the stream are, are if not two different species because they aren't but they are it's very different two different worlds you know two different kinds of fishing and and also different places because the sea runs will be in the bigger rivers and the bigger streams and the brown trout will typically be in the smaller like like streams and creeks, like like you would know from uh, from your local waters. Oh, okay, and so now back to the global fly fisher. So if somebody wanted to, you know, maybe kind of do a fishing, you know, similar fishery as what we're talking about here, how would they find that on your website? Is it just go to the search and would there be an yeah, article the, or something? That would be the easiest. You put in sea trout, and there will be a ton of uh, articles. And I have selected a few that will pop up in your search. So the main kind of you know introductory oh, yeah. articles will, uh, will pop up. Yeah. Yep. And and there will be introduction to flies and to gear and to oh, yeah. uh, to you know there will be also if people want to get a, an impression of the fishing, they will be able to see tons of pictures and read stories from people who have been fishing and told the, oh, cool. the story about you know. So, so I, I think essentially you can find almost anything you need except for, you know, the secret spot because that's one thing that you won't find on the site is no. like, you know, go here, park there. It's not like, you know, uh, a kiss and tell. It's more like, uh, you know, teaching you to find your own spots. And in most cases, if you come here, you can go into a local fly shop or, you know, tourist agency or something and you can ask and they will give you uh, a small you know, uh, booklet or something where where with information on where you can put your car, where you need to buy your license, and and okay. and uh, where you can go go fishing. And and most tackle shops, of course, are more than willing to make uh, to make your, you know, to help you if you if you ask them. So uh, okay, that's probably the the best. But but as I said, you can almost anywhere in Denmark, you can go out to the coast and you can find a place where you can fish. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I see it. I, that's cool. The editor's pick. Um, how do you do the editor's pick? How do you choose which, which, um, do you do that for each well, species? What I do is, it, I, I, yeah, exactly. What I do is actually for, for, for each search term that if you want, if you look for shrimp flies or something like that, what I do is actually pick out the best and the most thorough and maybe the best introduction to a certain topic. And so when you search for that, uh, 
particular topic instead of having the machine kind of going through and just you know picking out on on the you know on words yeah. or whatever they i they the first stuff you see is what i have yeah, chosen. chosen so it's exactly. i'm the editor so i picked it and i will show the the the, the, the most important articles on the subject that's so cool. Uh, yeah that's cool yeah i and see that, the uh, sea trout secrets and sea trout flies and yeah, spring, exactly. Springtime in Bornholm. I'm not sure if that's the yeah, right pronunciation. Exactly. Yeah, so that's yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, that's a, that's a, as I said, there are stories uh, from people who have been fishing. There's uh, tips on on choosing flies and gear. There's uh, you know how to arrange your trip and everything. There's well, a lot of help. There. And now you, now I'm looking at uh, this one on uh, a springtime and is it Bornholm? Bornholm, yeah. Bornholm. Um, and they're actually fishing. They're out there in. There's some breakers coming in on, on this one. On the f- couple of their yep. photos, it says wind. I guess that's what the wind is going to just like a lake is going to create some breakers with the wind. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, okay. Wow, this is amazing. Yeah, this is a great. I'll put a link to this one in the show notes there. And uh, you know, the fish I'm seeing. I'm not sure if that's you. Yeah, I think this is you with the fish. Um, those, those are nice fish. I mean, you're holding something Absolutely. that looks like it's about Absolutely. five, I, uh, five or six pounds or something like that. Yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah, and they're that's, beautiful. Uh, okay. That's uh, I mean, your average fish is probably like a, a two pound fish or something. Not even that. Maybe one and a half pounds. So it's not like huge, but you 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 can catch a few of those in a day, and you can you and you'll have a really nice experience. It's a beautiful place to to be. It's uh, the ocean is clean. It's as I said, the environment is clean. It's it's really nice. Yeah. So as as most fishermen, you know, it's not if it was you know, it was. Uh, it's it's called fishing for a reason and yeah. not catching. You know, we're we're fishing. You know, and and most fishermen go there, like hunters go there. They don't go there to fill the 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 pots necessary. They go to get an experience in nature and be alone and think about things and yeah. be together with friends. And it's the same cool. thing here. Of course, you if you if you you wouldn't be able to you know feed your family on fishing for no. sea trout and you have to go you know basically every day. But you will of course be able to get a really nice experience and see some countryside and see something different than you usually see. And we do keep a fish for the pot now and then. It's fully legal. You can do that. No problem. There's a lot of catch and release, but there's also, it's also quite common to bring home fish and eat them. Oh, it is. Okay. It's not like an endangered species or anything. No. So, so we do that also. Oh, cool. Do you get quite a few people coming up, you know, uh, to your, to that area to fish for these or is it yeah. more coming for Absolutely. Atlantic salmon that, or? As yeah. I said, yeah, uh, Germans. Uh, Germany is a huge country with very small coastline. Uh, uh, the Netherlands is a place where you have uh, a, a lot of people in a very small country, and and those are probably the most the common visitors here that that come to fish for for salmon or for for coastal sea trout. Actually, the the coastal fishing is very popular because people can go to the beach. As you know, people who live, you know, far away from the ocean is often fascinated by the ocean and it's it's uh, very easy to get to the ocean here. So Germans are very fond of going to the Danish beaches and a lot of them will fish. So um yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So that's cool. All right. Well, I think I I've got a good feeling like I said this is a very thorough article this um you know, you cover a little bit of everything you got um, getting there. And I mean, so that's awesome. And would you say for, I mean, how many articles do you have? Do you have any idea how many are, are published right now on your, on the site? Oh, thousands. thousands. Um, I can tell you. Yeah, definitely yeah. thousands. Um, I, I actually do have the numbers somewhere, but yeah. I don't remember where. Uh, I The thing about having a site this size is that um, I honestly forget what I have and where. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes people say, well, you have an article on that. Oh, I do I? <laughs> but you have it organized. It seems like you have it, it organized it, pretty well. It's fairly well organized. But as I said, when you run into into the numbers that, that uh, I'm doing here, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's just... I, I I lose you know my overview. I I really uh, can't see. Uh, there's probably about twenty five hundred articles to something, and and uh, there are you know dozens of thousands of pictures. I'm closing in on ten thousand videos, you know, in the video section. So it's oh, wow. like you know, yeah, uh, yeah. It's uh, and you post. Quite a bit. I, I noticed you have stuff. Um, you know, I, you grab videos, right? If it's not necessarily somebody doing an article, you might just see a video you like and you'll post yeah, it, right? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, basically videos that people post, other people post, and myself, I do videos too, but that people post on, on 
on YouTube or Vimeo or one of the, the you know video sites out there. What I do is I I uh, embed it in my site and try to organize it and tag it so that you can find like steelhead videos or videos on tank foam flies or whatever you know um, uh, when you when you go into the site. So it's kind of a way to. And what I do is actually I I look through the videos and I only take the best ones. So I kind of you yeah. know create the videos in a way that makes it uh, makes it easier for you to find the best videos on on, on the web and, and the cool, the <laughs> yeah, cool thing I, oh yeah go ahead no no if you if you go on youtube you know how you go on youtube oh, yeah. and your feet feet will be full of fly tying videos but yeah. you know honestly half of them are really crappy you know so yep. <laughs> so what i do is i go through all the crappy ones and i discard them and then i i take out the best ones and i put them on my site uh, and and uh, share them with people so you get you know the the top of the pops here yeah you're you're kind of like a you're like a fly fishing google you know like the search because i just searched in you know i just put in wet fly swing in the search box and it pulled up Three yeah. vi- three yeah. of my videos, which you know I didn't uh, didn't realize were out there. Yeah, and so you got um, oh. <laughs> one of them. One of them's the night dancer, which is a great steelhead fly that I think I tied with. Um, I think that was part of. Oh yeah, piscator flies. So oh, that's right. Yeah. So there's a great steelhead pattern of black and and a little bit of red. But yeah, so that's cool. So you yeah. basically yeah. are able to go out there, grab some 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 good videos, and and add them yeah. to the, to the mix. Yeah, and I spend a little time, you know, if not every day, maybe every second day or something, just going through the different channels and and picking out what I like mm-hmm. and what I think is worth, you know, bringing on to people. So that's yeah. great, awesome. So, and what do you think is? I mean, do you have any idea what your most popular uh, post is on there? Absolutely, I know exactly what my most popular post is. That's um, uh, the first setup. It's called first um, setup. First setup is. Um, if you put in that, the first setup is uh, an article on on uh, rigging your fly. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, her first setup. Deal with a line and and putting on backing Doing and stuff thing. like that. And that for some reason that has been read like you know, it's it's yep. hundred thousands of times. It's just amazing. I have no idea why, but yep. and this was I was preparing my own reel with a line and I thought you know what yeah. the heck I'll shoot some pictures and just make a small article because I mean it somebody might be able to use it and somebody has been I can tell you because it's been read so it keeps on popping up on my most popular articles list and it's like now it's 14 years old so there you go you know and it keeps on being the most read article so yeah, that's that's, that's right. definitely I know exactly which one it is okay okay cool um so yeah, so I guess you know, talking a little bit about your, you know, the sea trout thing. Is there anything else you'd put out there, you know, just for as far as tips or anything we missed if they're gonna, you know, somebody wanted to go out there? Ah, and well, we, yeah, we, we we gone around most things. One one thing that we haven't covered is um, is the fact that I don't fish that much much anymore. Uh, the reason being, which you might don't know, and which your listeners might don't know, that I was actually diagnosed with MS more than ten years oh, ago. Oh wow! So I actually not doing that well anymore <laughs> no kidding i'm doing fine thank you yeah. but not as good as i could i could wish i'm i'm most of the time i'm in a wheelchair i can't fish wading anymore i can't walk in the stream i can't really walk that far and one thing that i keep on saying i'm 60 years old now basically i'm yeah. 59 but i'm 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 not an old man, but i'm not young anymore right and i've been fishing i've been trying different things but i usually go you know, when I when I talk to people, I say, if you have any plans, if you want to go, like if you want to fish for steelhead in British Columbia, if you want to go for, you know, to New Zealand to fish for brown trout, if you want to go bone fishing in the Caribbean, go now. Yep. Do not wait. Do not wait for retirement. Do not wait for the lotto win. Do not wait for your wife to allow you to go or your kids to grow up because suddenly one day – you're in a wheelchair. <laughs> right. I hope it doesn't happen. It happened to me. You know. Yep. I wanted to go to New Zealand. I I had to you know, cancel a trip to New Zealand because I was working. The stupidest, dumbest excuse you can imagine. Not going fishing because you're working. What kind of excuse is that? I know. Now I will I can go to New Zealand now, but I can never take the trip that I wanted to do because I, I can't. You know. Simply can, and and that's I, I usually always try to 
tell people that when I do presentations, when I do anything, when I talk to people like you, I yep. tell people and your listeners and everybody who wants to listen to me, go now, do not wait, because you have no idea what life has in store for you. You have no idea what happens, you know. You could it could be it could be a, a happy incident. You might be, you know, get a new job which will, you know, move right. you to someplace else and you will be busy. You get a wife and a family which will occupy all your time. You might, you know, or it might be the other way around. You might lose your job and not have money. You might lose your health like I did and not be able to. So if you want to do anything, do not think that you will do it in 10 years or 15 years or when you get old because you might not be able to. So right. go now. That's right. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, uh, you know, your your honesty in, in sharing that because, um, you know, it's that's a thing that I think about as well, you know. I mean, obviously there's – lots of things that happen that keep you from getting out fishing, doing the stuff you love. But, um, you know, in the, in the global fly fisher, this is something I was kind of thinking about, you know, asking as well, you know, I mean, long term when, when we're, you know, when you're gone, when, when I'm gone, that sort of thing. I mean, what happens to the global fly fisher? I mean, are you pretty much running well, the thing? <laughs> yeah, the thing is, that, you know, this is a new thing in, 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 everybody's life what happens to your facebook profile what happens oh, yeah. to your <laughs> email right. archive what happens to your podcasts when you are not here anymore it's like you know what happens to in the old day it, it was more like what happens to your rots and what happens to your books and your flies and your stuff well you know your sons might be interested or you know uh, somebody might buy it and put it into a collection or something but what happens to you know two three thousand articles online and videos and texts yep. and stuff like that well i have no idea no i'm idea. i i'm actually i've been thinking about it and maybe i i need to you know make some kind of digital will or something saying you know i will put all the passwords yep. and all the instructions and something into a vault somewhere and then i will give the keys to somebody exactly. that i trust why you, you know why when you i'm give, uh, done why don't you give the keys to me and i'll take care of it for you and yeah <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yeah and 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 that it, i i've actually been thinking about it not that i intend to die right away but we all have to go at some point you know or or it might you know honestly i i'm 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 realistic enough to know that i can become very ill very quickly and and that's uh, that's a risk that i have to face and um it, it would be uh, smart of me i think to be prepared for that situation yeah, and if i want the site to live and to keep on going and to you know be maintainable i need to tell somebody else how to do it and and that's probably a, a thing that i have to think about so yeah yeah Maybe you have sparked that in me, and I will start thinking about it. Yeah, I think I think you should because uh, yeah, obviously, yeah, we're you know we're not dying tomorrow, but um, but yeah, but, but oh. in fifty years, you know, it'd be great to have this resource. And who knows what inter the internet looks like then? But you know, who knows? I mean, maybe it could be oh, a great exactly. resource, oh. and and oh. I, we'd hate to lose. And it. you have a lot of what is called uh, rot on the web. You know, things that just get left, and and. You know, uh, in most cases, uh, at you know, within a couple of years or something, the the provider, the hosting company, whatever, will shut it down and just delete it. But in in you would be surprised if you look around, you will find stuff that was made in like two thousand and two thousand and ten or something that's still online and nobody touches it anymore. But for some reason, it's still out there, just lying around. And of course, most of it is okay, but a lot of it is is way out of date and not useful anymore but it's still there you go on google and you search to find something and you'll say whoa is that really true no it isn't it was true in 2010 but it's not true anymore so yeah. it's like things things kind of wither you know and just kind of you know fade away slowly right. and i would be sad to see my websites fade away in that way so oh. i would be happy if somebody else would take it over oh, so good. we'll yeah, see let, let, let's uh, let, <laughs> let's keep in touch on that no i mean i think there's there's a few i mean i think you know of, of an orvis or some big you know a, a company that's going to be out there for a long time likely you yeah. know or, or somebody yeah. who's doing like calling you know with the new fly fisher i mean obviously he's got the utah the, somebody like that that could just you know they could basically just yeah. add it to their archive and if yeah know, exactly online. but yeah but yeah that's yeah, I've been thinking that, that's a little ways like off that. and I, I think about the same thing too because with the podcast i mean i have you know just a couple of years now of shows but um i would love to have that out there for um you know, for people to keep, you know, checking out down yeah. the line, my yeah. kid, you know, Absolutely. kids and stuff like that. But, yeah. okay. Well, yeah, we, I mean, obviously that's a, that's a pretty deep conversation and, um, 
you know, I'm not sure if, uh, I haven't really, you know, been affected by anybody with MS, but, um, I'm sure there are people in the audience that, that have, and, you know, I, I, is there a, you know, when, is there a resource or something that for people that are kind of connected to that or how do you, how do you deal with it? No, I, I, what I do is actually, I use myself as a resource. So to say, I volunteer to do a lot of things and try to keep, you know, I, I work as an informant for the Danish MS society and I do stuff. I kind of use, try to use my disease in a a positive way might not be the right term, but you know what I mean? I try to turn it around to, to, to be an asset rather than something that really bogs me down. And it's possible. It's not easy, but it's possible and it helps me getting through. And as I usually say to people when I talk about my disease, for me, it's kind of therapy to be allowed to talk about my disease because usually I don't touch on it if I can avoid it because right. it's not a nice story. But sometimes it's really nice to be allowed to talk about something that's bad for you. And I do that by, you know, telling you and telling your audience yeah. and, and by talking to people about it. And then I can kind of feel fresh and, and ready to, you know, I can go through another week or two without bothering about it, you know, and, and yeah. not being concerned. So in most cases, what I, what I, what I try to, you know, the advice that I give to people is really be open about it, but don't be your disease. Don't, don't kind of be that guy, you know, no. you know, you always meet people when you go to parties or when you go somewhere and they will just start talking about their, you know, if not their own cancer, then their father's cancer right. or their MS or their heart, you know, uh, uh, whatever, you know, yep. seizures and all kind. Of, you don't <laughs> want to be that guy. You don't want to be that guy who is like, oh my God, we can't invite him because he's such a bore, you know, right. he's such a terrible company. <laughs> so I try not. I try not to be that guy. But of course, if people ask me, I'm more than willing to talk about it because information is also important and knowledge is, of course, also important. Gotcha. So if people are, are you know, whatever kind of things they go and, and, you know, drag around, try to be open about it and try to talk to people about it. But don't be your disease. Don't be that guy because it's, as I said, I, I personally hate them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I hear you. I hear you. Okay. Well, um, yeah, let's jump in. I got a little rapid fire around here that'll kind of help uh, wrap this thing up. Um, and, you know, we, we've been talking about sea trout this, um, you know, this episode. If you had to say, you know, the 222, your top two um, flies, tips and resources, do you have, do you have two uh, flies that your your go-to flies out there? Yeah, if you if you actually another article on the way to uh, to uh, to the website is a, a fly on on uh, sorry an article on two two fly patterns. There's uh, two very popular flies here, which are basically both kind of woolly bugger flies. You know, uh-huh. full hackle flies. One, one is co- one is called the fret or in Danish frede. Uh-huh. with a soft D, and the other one is called Maunus, uh, which is a Magnus in, in, in English. Right. These two are, are kind of, you know, nondescript, gray, neutral, woolly bugger type flies. Mm-hmm. You can find them both on the website, of course. And uh, they are extremely efficient flies. And I'll bet you that they, I, I know that they can catch bass and that they can catch uh, perch and they can catch bonefish and they oh, yeah. can catch bro- Trout, they, you know, woolly burgers are basically, you know, they can catch everything. Yeah. And these are woolly burgers, but they, they're like small bait fish, shrimpy, buggy things, uh, and really, really efficient. And I, I always have those two flies in my in okay. my boxes. They're really nice flies. Yeah. And as I, there will be an article on, on these two flies and, of course, a gazillion of variations over them, which have, you know, uh, popped up over the years. There's been a lot of of very variations made you know for for different mm-hmm. purposes yeah it's basically the magnus is just a like grizzly hackle with a um, yeah kind of exactly. a, yeah a gray body with yeah. a little uh, rib it has and, a big chain eyes on and and yeah. you know it's it's a and it, it's also an easy flight to tie it's also easy materials to get to mm-hmm. so it's like you know it's a win 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 yeah. situation totally. so uh, and it's a really good fly for for sea trout and as i said i've caught bonefish on it i caught bass on it i've caught all kinds of fish on it so it, gotcha. it works for, for what, sea trout what's the um what's the knot you typically use to tie your fly on when you're fishing for sea trout? i use a a a, a, a loop yeah, a surgeon's loop. loop okay yeah, the open loop, typically 
uh, because we fish fairly heavy uh, tippets here, like like two x or three x or something. So so you want something which make allows the fly to move a bit. And we often fit fish in the salt here. We fish fairly small flies when you compare to other saltwater uh, kinds of saltwater fishing. Typically, you will fish like a, 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 a six eight or or size ten fly or something in the ocean, which for many anglers is like ah, oh, how can the fish see such a small fly in the ocean? Yeah. Well. They can. Yep. I can tell you, they can. They <laughs> it can. works. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, and you even have a, for the Magnus, you have a little um, a recipe here and uh, some yep. other, yeah, you got actually step-by-step -step tying it. That, that, that's why, yep. yeah, you've got a lot of useful stuff in here. That's cool. Okay. Yep. And what about, you know, your top two tips? If, and you could just say, if you wanted to say generally fly fishing, I don't know, are there any articles or tips that come to mind as, as far as, you know, just kind of two of the big tips Some that might help somebody get in some well, fish? Well, if, if you're talking fishing tips. I, I, one of the, it, it actually uh, is is kind of along the same lines as my my you know go fishing tip. Yeah. One of the most important things that I think that people should remember is to relax. You know, really, it's really important when you go mm -hmm. fishing. Also, remember to you know lie down on the bank and let your rod rest next to you and just close your eyes or open your eyes and enjoy it being there. You mm -hmm. know. Just relax. You don't have to kind of flog the water, and you don't have to walk up and down the the, the the stream or whatever you're fishing. You don't have to, you know, if you're in a boat, you go from one place to the other. Drop the anchor and, you know, lie down and enjoy the life, you know. It, it, I meet quite a lot of people. I get all stressed out when I fish with them because they're so busy. Make a cup of coffee, sit down, and remember that you're there to relax. You're there to recharge your batteries. You're there to kind of, oh, you know, yeah. get the shoulders down. Hmm. And if you don't do that, you, you'll you come back, like, all wound up, and all you want to do is go again. Like, the sooner, you're better. You know, it's like, right. you know, and if, if we have, we, we call it fishing the Danish way. We've introduced fishing the Danish way many, many places. I've been out with many, many times out with good friends. And all that we've done basically on a whole day of fishing is sitting on the beach, drinking coffee and chatting. You know, and then, of course, you have to get into the water to get your waders wet. But phew, who cares? Yeah. I mean, we're there to relax. We get, you know, you can talk about girlfriends. You can talk about, you know, the kids are acting. You can talk about the bank that won't lend you money or whatever. And you can kind of get things worked through, which is really good for you. It's good for your health, it's good for your mind. And it it does recharge your batteries like you always talk about when you, when you go fishing. Much more than stressing around to find the fish and catch the fish and get the biggest one or get the most fish or whatever. Yeah. Which is also fun and shouldn't be forgotten. But remember to relax that's a great yeah that's a great point yeah you don't want to forget about the uh yeah why we're out there you know you know going for it and taking the time off um well this this might be kind of a harder question for you since you've got such a a great resource you know your website but are there any other you know specifically if you think about sea trout any uh, uh, resources you'd recommend either online or books or magazines or anything yeah but when 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 if you want to know about fish Actually, there is a one one great site called, called Fishbase. If you look up Fishbase, oh, yeah. I think fishbase.org or something, yeah. which is a, a, a natural, you know, a scientific um, mm -hmm. uh, fish base. Des basically, a database on fish, which will tell you everything about every single fish in all the world, like all over the world. So you can find the Ukrainian name for, you know, uh, whatever, stickleback, and you can find out how widespread are they, when do they spawn, what do they eat, uh, how big do they grow, whatever. You know, you can you can find everything about fish. It's not a beautiful site. It's not an no. easy site to navigate, but it's a really, really useful site that's, if you want to know about fish. That's cool. And I, I just searched, uh, yeah, fish basin. It's funny thing, I searched sea trout. And here's the interesting thing that comes up is that, you know, uh, Salmaltruda comes up. So it, a lot of brown trout, obviously, but then you've got uh, Ankarika's Kisuch, you know, you get yeah. into some Pacific salmon and then also the, the brook trout. Um, yeah. So you've got all these. So you've got these three or multiple species that people call sea trout. But when I think of sea yeah. trout, sea, sea trout is basically a trout that goes into the sea. So it's kind of you know it's not really precisely describing anything you know. So no, but I but I do <laughs> we think, have a lot of trout. Yeah, you have a lot. I, I do think of it as and maybe that's just my bias, but I think of it as brown trout. And I I think even Orvis had an article or something on the brook trout 
uh, which are also, you know, known as sea trout. But okay, yeah, no, that's a yeah. good resource. Any, any other um, resources out there? Well, basically, no, uh, not not fishing related. Honestly, I I don't read many fishing websites or or mm-hmm. you know magazines and stuff like that. I'm I'm uh, quite a lot into books. I love books, but I don't read that many online online uh, things about fishing sure. anymore. I tend to produce them instead of uh, you yep. know consuming them. But uh, yeah, yeah, okay. And what um, you know, as far as your trip, you mentioned um, you know New Zealand. Or what what do you think is your you know your kind of your your dream trip or that trip? I mean, it sounds like you've taken some. I mean, I I haven't been out for bonefish yet. It sounds like you've you've done a, some fishing. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it, lucky me. I I've been uh, I've been lucky enough to be able to fish. I've been to British Columbia. I've been to you know uh, Greenland. I've been to the Caribbean to fish for bonefish and tarpon, and yeah. I've been different places. So I've fished in re- Europe, uh, many places in Europe, in the UK, in Ireland, in you know Germany and places. So I've been I, I was lucky enough to be able to travel, and I'm really glad that I did because if I had been planning on doing it now, well, it yep. wouldn't have happened. So right. I've, 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 as I said, you know, I, I was lucky enough to go while I still, still could, and I, I can't emphasize enough that I think people should do the same thing. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. um, and I have nothing really on my bucket list where I think, oh my God, I would love to go to New Zealand. And yeah. I know people say, you know, just come, we'll make it, we'll, we'll right. float you downstream, or we will take you out in a boat, and or we will do something. And I, I definitely, there's, there's a lot of, of, of options there, and a lot of people will say, well, you know, it's not your disability is not a the big problem here it's getting there actually you know getting oh, right. to the places yes. in most cases as you probably can imagine people will be extremely helpful if you kind of you know show up in your wheelchair yeah. <laughs> and mm-hmm. it, it, it people will suddenly you know grow extra arms for you and and really do all they can to help you so i'm i'm really privileged when it comes to that so it's mostly my own you know level of energy and and my own kind of you know willingness to go that's keeping me from not going so right. so well, we'll see yeah, i'll yeah. probably get out again so yeah okay and what about the you know the global fly fish we're talking about this big uh big picture stuff i mean you know in say 50 years if you know obviously there's going to be lots of information still out there regardless of you know how the internet changes what would you like it to be remembered for you know kind of when when you're gone when we're all gone in 50 or 100 years well I, you know i i i don't know i have no no delusions when when it comes to that but i definitely think that the the resource that it is now puts it in in a league like you uh, your, like your classic books or something you yeah. know books that people will talk about and say well that book i know i i had that book that was a really great book you know mm-hmm. and or maybe i still have that book in my in my in my shelf and i still use it now and then i, I would love to to see the site be around in like 10 20 years or something and be you know, containing the stuff that it has being updated and and still being being popular uh, and and uh, and definitely there's a most of what is on here is totally timeless and can be used Mm -hmm. for you know tying knots won't won't be different you know now and and 10 years and 20 years from now so you know if you want to tie learn to tie knots well you can go on here landing wild fish the right way is also (laughs) be done the same way 10 years from now and there's still stuff to learn then 70 degrees will still be 70 degrees you know uh, in the future so there's a lot of things to learn that I, it, it for me it's kind of a register and archive of of you know knowledge which uh, I, I i i think is valuable in the future as well as it is now yeah that's that's a great point and so in uh, articles that, you know you've been sent you said you've had some stuff that hasn't been the greatest i mean how many articles have you turned down have you turned down a lot of submissions no not many, no. not many. I'm, I'm very in, in some cases. What I turn down is basically when people are too commercial, when it's oh, obvious yeah. that they are, you know, I want to write about kayaks. I can put in some fly fishing, and then you, you know, link back to my site, which is you know best, yep. best kayak reviews right. online. <laughs> yeah, right. com, you know, whatever. Yeah. And you go onto the site, and you see like ten kayak Spammy. reviews, all linking to Amazon. Yeah. Which is where I say, you know what? Thank you, but no thanks. No. Uh, most other articles, I say thank you, and and I try to work with people and get uh, you know the best quality I can get from it, yeah. and and make sure that uh, because as I said, most people will tell an interesting story. Most people will have a lot of 
with fly fishermen and fly tires, we have interesting tips and something that can help others. Mm -hmm. Or we have, you know, devised some method of doing something which is really brilliant and that needs to, you know, deserves to get out there. So, yeah. 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 Okay, Martin. Well, I think uh, we're about there. Any, um, you know, in the next uh, six to 12 months, any anything uh, you have coming new for yourself or, you know, the, the global fly fishing you want to let us know about? Oh. Not really. I take a couple of trips a year with good friends. We take a week-long fishing trip. There's one coming up in September, and that's uh, that's the next kind of big fishing trip I'm going on, which is just a, a trip to a place in Denmark, typically. But we have people coming from, you know, Germany, the Netherlands, Sweden, other places, and sometimes even an American coming over. And uh, we'll go fishing, eat eat nice food, and drink a a, a bit of scotch, and, and go, go fishing. Is that your? Yeah. Uh, is that your? When you get off the the river after a nice day fishing for sea trout, what what's your? Is that your drink of choice? Well, you know, we drink. I think does it have alcohol? Yes, we we'll drink it. It's not like we are drunk or anything, but people <laughs> yeah. are not that picky. But we definitely like a good scotch. That's that's a, that's okay. a very that's among the friends that I fish with. It's it's a it's the preferred um, you know is. liquor. Definitely. That's cool. And good food. Most people can cook and will will make some good meals and, uh, you know, yeah. nice meal and a glass of what red wine is also very welcome. So, and, yeah. And what about in Denmark, just shortly on Denmark, because it sounds like, I mean, I haven't been to Denmark um, or Germany, but, you know, you just, when you hear Denmark, it sounds like one of those places that you just, you know, you have to go. It sounds like an amazing place. What, what um, you know, what makes Denmark special, do you think? I don't know. Uh, it's a it's it's a very safe country, which is uh, nice to, how, to most people. How is it different uh, than Germany? Just smaller? Germany, much smaller. Like the Germans are like 80 million or something and we're just six. So yeah. it's uh, it's way smaller. Uh, it's also um, less developed, typically, uh, even though we do have uh, we do have uh, uh, so we don't have the large wildernesses or something like that, but it's it's not that uh, there's the biggest city is like one million. Uh, it's Copenhagen where I live, yeah. And most other cities are way smaller. There's a lot of countryside. It's quite um, there's a lot of agriculture. And as I said, first of all, Denmark is probably for most uh, foreigners it's dominated by ocean you will see the ocean everywhere yeah. you will go along the beach you will drive along the beach you will cross ocean on bridges uh, you will there's a, a lot of ocean around here so did, going to the ocean how long does is it take never a long trip how long does it take to drive from the east to west from one you know one side of the ocean to the other well it you know from Going from from where I live to, which is like way to the east, to the northern and most western part of of the country, is probably a six hour drive. Oh, oh wow, yeah, yeah. Okay, and, and I'm not totally on my geography. I'm not totally on it. So, I, yeah, obviously, Copenhagen is is kind of Copenhagen a separate... is way to the east uh, yeah. on on you know close to Sweden, and and uh, there's a, a peninsula which is connected. We are on an island, and there's a peninsula connected to Germany on the other side. And if you go across, there's a bridge across, so you can actually go. A car all the way, and it's a, like a four, five, six hour drive to get to the west coast. And if you go up north, six hours or something, and which is about the longest drive you can take here if you go if you don't want to go into the water. So it's not yeah. a big country. It's not like it's like you know when I, I have we have a guest coming over from Boston uh, in September, and they said you know we'd like to see we'll visit you in Copenhagen. Then we'd like to see like you know see Skane, which is like the way north, and we'd like to see Ribe, which is a small town in the south and we say well it's a pretty long drive you know mm -hmm. well, you know these guys go into new york to see a, you know right. a, a, a play in a theater uh, from boston you know it's a five hour six hour drive who cares you know right. <laughs> so so yeah. it the, the the distances are very different here so okay, uh, okay. no it sounds it sounds cool and i love the uh the public uh, part of it, you know, I think there's some places obviously where the beaches are private. So it sounds like the government is doing a, a good job to keep things accessible yeah, for people. We have no private beaches here. There is no, no Hampstead or anything. You can't, you can access the beach everywhere. As I said, you can always walk. If you want it, if you want to walk around Denmark along the beach, you can do it. You can okay. basically start and walk all the way around. There will be a few places, as I said, where it's 
birds are protected or something, and maybe the military will not want you to walk into their bases. But yeah. all other places, even in front of the big mansions and the biggest, most expensive houses, you're allowed you're allowed to go into the water and fish, and you're allowed to get to the water. So it's very accessible. And also, at the same time, it's actually accessible in the way that you can drive to the water in many places, and you can park your car and walk. So it's not like you're kept away from from places, which is one of the things that makes it very attractive. Okay. And uh, and what about just uh, before I let you go here, uh, a, a tip on if somebody wanted to, you know, get into more writing articles online or starting a website or, you know, you've got 25 years, which is amazing, right? You're you there at the beginning. Any tips for somebody that wants to kind of do what yeah. you've done? Yeah, definitely. One thing is if you, if you do it, you've got to mean it. I mean, you've got to, I, I have seen, especially when, when blogging started, like taking off maybe 10, 15 years ago, mm-hmm. when people would start blogs and you'd have WordPress and sites yep. like that, where you could start a blog, people would jump in and start a blog. They would write, you know, a, a, a blog entry, you know, the first week and one the second week. And then one week and a half, you know, later they would write the third one and then Two weeks later, they would write the fourth one, yep. and the sixth one would come like two months later, and there would n- never come anything else. There would never be more. So it's not like you can, you can, if you want to do something like that, you really got to mean it, and also you really have to have something on your heart or have something somebody help you because you would be surprised. It's not easy to come up with good subjects no. you know keep on going you might think that your fishing trips are fantastic you want to post uh, trip reports and pictures from every trip but it becomes boring yeah so at one point it's the same same you know you yeah. know i went out you know i went to the stream i caught some brown trout it was nice you know i used these flies which were the same flies i used last year and the year before that you know <laughs> blah 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 yeah so what I do is I try to the way that I keep on going and I I kind of pick up ideas from people asking questions to you know I get a mail people ask me something and I say yeah I can I can answer that and I will make a mental note and say you know that might be a good idea for for uh, an article I get annoyed by something like I got annoyed by the fact that people confuse the two flies that I talked about before the the, the Fred oh, and yeah. the Magnus. And I get annoyed because they, they are two different flies with two different stories tied in two different ways. And we see all, as you do with flies, you know, you see yeah. all these uh, hybrids that are something in between and people call it one and actually tie the other one. I got annoyed by that. And I made a note to myself, you know, I want to put this right. I want to tell the real story about the articles, their history, and I want to show people how to tie them right. So that way I keep on getting new ideas. Also, of course, being able to reach out to other people and and having them cont- contribute articles will of course also make it easier for you to keep going because the technological side of the of, of, of the whole thing which was a big thing when I started isn't there anymore it's so easy to start mm-hmm. something you can you can go online and find a place to publish stuff you know within minutes and, and you can start going and all the sure. tools are there you can make nice layouts you can upload pictures and scale them you can do all kinds of things so all that stuff is is like trivial compared to getting good stuff yeah yeah, yeah. but i would say if you're like if you're a rod builder or you make reels, or you mm-hmm. make hooks, or you make landing nets, or you do something which is like special. That kind of uh, information is really wanted out there. I see a lot of, you know, the more niche, the niche in the niche, so to say, um, dyeing your own material, yeah. uh, you know, skinning your own birds, uh, or using what you get when you go hunting or something for fly tying. What new, stuff like that is really. Uh, want it and and i uh, and, and if, if you can do something on on that it's uh, it's a very good idea yeah no for sure well uh, uh martin before i let you go just one uh question here on uh, on music uh, do you have any uh, music uh, you like to listen to any bands or uh people or well, types of yeah, music i'm uh, i'm i'm an old geezer as i said i'm uh, <laughs> i'm uh I'm 60, uh, yep. turning 60 in October. So, uh, so I'm an old geezer. Let me bring out my, uh, yeah, my, um, let's hear the, what's on the pod on the, uh, or yeah, what, exactly. what is it? I guess it's the phone. Most people. <laughs> uh, exactly. I have my, my, my streaming service here oh, cool. through my, let's hear it. and I will go into my favorites and you would be surprised. Yeah. Um, this is oh, good. it's forgotten who I am. I just need to log in here. Hang on. So, yep. 
So the first, the I have, I have. Let me see. Paul Desmond and Jerry Mulligan. They're jazz musicians. Oh, okay. I have them. Uh -huh. uh, I have the latest uh, Bruce Springsteen. Oh, really? Bruce Springsteen's still yeah. going. Yeah, that's really, really a great. I have Daft Punk. Okay. I have James Brown. Oh. I have I'm Going Down. I have Genesis, an old uh, acid yeah. rock band from Genesis. the UK. That, that was, uh, <laughs> what was that Phil? Was that Phil Collins? No. Yeah, exactly. It was, yeah. yeah. I have, yeah, I have Grace Jones. I have Prince. There you go. I have the Beatles. You got a mix. I have Emily Lou Harris. I have uh, Talking Heads. So, I mean, I'm really uh, Robert Johnson, an old uh, uh -huh. guitarist, blues guitarist. So, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Cool. Uh, so, I don't have much really new stuff. I do have some new stuff, but I'm, as you can probably hear, I'm, I'm, I'm old school. Yeah, yeah. Prince, no. Sent, whatever. No, it's good. So, what? Um, yeah. So, I. If you had All to... kinds. I, the new Bruce Springsteen is really good. I, okay. I, I really enjoy that. That's, okay. that's a very nice album. I'll, I love uh, it. So. I'll try to find a, I'll try to find a link or something to put in the show notes to, if yeah, I can. Yeah. It's, uh, I've always, always liked what he did and I definitely like the new one. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. So Martin, well, I think that's about it. Um, if they want to find you, uh, globalflyfisher.com is Dot the best com. place. Yep. Absolutely. Okay, Martin. Well, I appreciate you. Uh, we've definitely uh, spent some time here digging into everything you have going, and I yeah, I really appreciate you connecting here. I know, um, obviously, from my first article four years ago, almost now, you you helped me get started. So I want to thank you for that, and everybody else. You know, You're I'm welcome. sure you've you've uh, helped yeah. spread fly fishing around the world. So uh, thanks for that. Yeah, man, well, I'm the one who said thank you because people want to read it, which is really the only reason that it's there. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's right. That's right. All right, Martin, we'll keep in touch with you and talk to you soon. Perfect. Thank you. All right. See you. Take care. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash Martin. Interested in heading out on a fly fishing trip uh, with me and a few of the great guests from the podcast? There's still a few slots available for this upcoming summer. So uh, head out over to wetflyswing.com slash uh, destination. That's D E S T I nation to find out more and get your name on the list. I wanted to read a quick review before we uh, head out here from uh, Jordan Ray on Apple Podcasts. Jordan says, uh, possibly the best fly fishing podcast out there. One of the best resources available with in depth information on the finer details of swinging flies. If you play, uh, pay close attention, you can learn a lot here and really shorten the learning curve. And if you're an expert angler already, there's a ton of good history and stories from great guests and guides from across the country. Hey, Jordan, uh, Jordan Ray, uh, I really appreciate the review. This is awesome. I read every one, and um, definitely when I get a chance to read them online here, this is great. Um, if you want to leave a review, go to wetflyswing.com slash review to find out how you can uh, quickly leave a review for the show. Thanks again for stopping by. Check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up soon and hope to maybe see you on the river or online. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.